I'm supposed to talk about immigration today, specifically illegal immigration. This being, of course, a historic year on immigration um, that people like me, the 11 million undocumented people who live amongst you, who go to school with you, who shop with you, who build this economy, are finally going to get legal status. But I'm not here to talk about that. I am here to actually talk about citizenship. Um, and this is, I, you know, I'm a journalist and we have this group called Define Americans. So went to Merriam-Webster and found this definition, a noun, the quality of an individual's response to membership in a community. So that's one definition. As far as I'm concerned, there's no more important word than citizenship to me, just because I've been fighting for it my whole life. Citizenship is how we welcome and accept immigrants in this country, this country that was founded on the idea of citizenship, government by the people for the people, in a country built and re-energized, always re-energized, by immigrants. And as we talk about the future of immigration and citizenship, as we debate and decide issues like border security, it's paramount I think that we remember our past, right? Like Ellis Island, America's first immigration station where nearly one out of three Americans can trace their ancestors. And as I've been traveling around the country in places like Alabama, Iowa, Wisconsin, Arkansas, I like to remind people that between, the, between 1892 and 1954, 12 million undocumented white people from Europe crossed the border called the Atlantic Ocean and landed on Ellis Island. They were inspected, they were welcomed. I don't know if you know this, but the Italians, when they showed up, were called WAPs. I don't know if you knew that WAPs actually stood for without papers. So here we are, nearly 60 years after Ellis Island closed, and we're arguing, and we are facing another migration of another 12 million people. 12 million people migrated through Ellis Island in those 50, 60 years. We're talking again about another 12 million, and this time, they're not just migrating from Europe, although 300,000 of the undocumented people in America are from Europe, undocumented white people. But we're talking mostly about people who are coming from places like Mexico, or the Philippines, or Guatemala, or Korea, or China. So they used to call people WAPs, now they call us illegal, right? So I think that's kind of important to keep in mind. And yes, I believe that a country has a right to protect and define its borders, like any modern and functioning nation. But we have to remember that people have been migrating since the beginning of time. People move for economic, religious, political reasons, people move. And to me, the two biggest questions that never get, that never get brought up, and as I'm saying, this is somebody who's been on MSNBC, on Fox, and a lot of other shows, what do US foreign policy and US trade agreements have to do with migration patterns? What did NAFTA do to Mexico in its economy as to white people moving, right? That's one question. The second question, why is it that when we talk about immigration in this country, we always frame it as a problem and not as a solution? Why don't we ever talk about the fact that we're building, we're trying to build a multilingual, multi-ethnic, multicultural American economy that can compete in a flattening 21st century economy? Why don't we talk about that? Right? So I'm getting a little too ahead of myself. I'm here, like many of us, because of the sacrifices of my grandparents. Uh, my grandparents legally immigrated from the Philippines to Silicon Valley in the mid-1980s. Uh, my grandfather, once he became a US citizen, changed his name from Teofilo to Ted, <laughs> after Ted dancing in Cheers. <laughs> because grandparents, I don't know if you know this, because grandparents cannot petition their grandkids and because parents cannot petition their married children, that's the immigration law for you, 
My grandfather decided that he was going to save up $4,300, which is a lot of money for a security guard who was making $8 an hour, to get me, his only grandson, to America. So he saved up $4,300 to buy a passport and a green card. My mother gave me up to give me a better life. I arrived here on August 3rd, 1993, and I just loved it. <laughs> I think I, I just loved how different it was and how m one of my earliest memories was at sixth grade at Crittenden Middle School, looking around my classroom and seeing how all these different people who look different, who kind of just seem different, and yet we're all in the same room and we would like recite this national anthem thing and I actually thought it said in the beginning, oh Jose, can you see? <laughs> No, I did. I was just like, oh, I'm like, it's, they're so friendly. I just got here and already my name is in the national anthem. Um, but then of course, like one of my classmates, Sherman Curl was like, dude, Jose, like we're not talking about you. <laughs> Four years after this, when I was 16, like any 16 year old, I went to the DMV to get my driver's permit. And I didn't tell my grandparents, I just went. And I showed the woman at the booth my green card. And then she flipped it around and she said, this is fake don't come back here again. So that's how I found out. But mind you, when she said this, all I could, all I could think was, wait a second, like, I'm Filipino. <laughs> you know, I grew up in the, the Proposition 187, Pete Wilson era in California when illegal meant Mexican. Isn't that horrible? And I thought to myself, wait, maybe she's confused because my name is Jose Antonio Vargas. Maybe she thought I was just, you know, Mexican. So, I got home and I'm, I'm thinking to myself, wait, look, this is, not, this is not right. My grandfather, however, said, yes, what are you doing? He said two things. One, what are you doing showing that to people, the green card? Two, you're not supposed to be here. So that's how I found out. And then that's how I also found out that immigration is not only a Mexican Latino issue, right? It's also an Asian issue. And for me, I was 16 years old. I was a freshman in high school. I didn't, know what to, I didn't know what to do with myself. I couldn't understand why my grandparents lied to me about this. But I thought to myself, what if my name may not be on a piece of paper to be here legally, but what if I'm on a piece of paper? So I started writing. I started becoming a journalist. And the reason for that is when you write, you have a thing called a byline. So I thought maybe if I should just wrote as many news stories as I could, <laughs> I could just write my way into America. I thought you could just be a citizen by doing that. And for me, journalism was a way of existing, of exercising citizenship, of contributing and paying taxes to this country. And I don't know if you know this, and it, this is really important to remember, but to be undocumented in this country is to be obsessed with documents, with pieces of paper. The first paper that I had to get to get jobs, my grandfather bought for me. It was a fake social security card. So he bought a card. We went to Kinko's. He cut like one piece of white tape and he put it on top of the card that said not valid for work. He made 25 photocopies and that's what I showed the San Francisco Chronicle, the Washington Post, the Huffington Post, the Pulitzer Committee, the New Yorker, and all the other jobs. All the time I keep thinking every time I would give the social security thing, isn't the government going to check? <laughs> they never did. But then I would get a letter from the IRS saying, hey, you owe money. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> That's how people like me have paid $11.2 billion in state and local taxes just in 2010. Now, the first time I had to fill out an employment form when I was a freshman in college, I remember filling out this form and it said clearly, Check a box if you're a US citizen. Check a box if you're a green card holder. Now, my green card was fake, so I couldn't check the box, but I'm not a US citizen. And in the bottom of the thing, it says, you would go, it, it was perjury, and it, it was not legal to be checking that box. But I wanted the job, so I checked the box. <laughs> and I remember having a conversation with myself saying, wait up a second, so, Maybe I could just earn what it is to be a citizen. Maybe that was just something that you just worked towards, right? The second piece of document I got for myself, and Washington State has something to do with it, 
When the Washington Post offered me a job, they said I couldn't show up without a driver's license. So I realized that there are at least two states in the country that give people like me a license. One of them was Oregon. So I went to Oregon. I passed the driver's test. I got a 71 out of 70. I was so worried about parallel parking, I almost flunked the entire thing. And then I got the license and it was valid for eight years. And I thought I had eight years to prove myself, again, to prove myself and earn citizenship. So those eight years went by. I covered a presidential campaign for the Washington Post. I did a documentary on AIDS. I won a Pulitzer Prize. I succeeded my way into it without any piece of paper to show for it. And then one of my turning points was right before I turned 30, when my license was about to expire, when Mark Zuckerberg asked me, I was interviewing him for a profile for The New Yorker, and Mark Zuckerberg, the Facebook dude, says, Jose, where are you from, man? And I kind of, I was just kind of done. <laughs> where I was from was a place where I hadn't seen my mom for 20 years this August. Where I'm from is a place where I felt like a liar and I felt like a coward. I felt like all these young dreamers and undocumented young people are coming out, including in the state of Washington. How dare I keep quiet while I'm living comfortably in my apartment in New York. Where I was from was a place where I couldn't face my life. I had like a three month deadline. So I profiled Mark Zuckerberg for the New Yorker. My license was about to expire. And then I discovered that the great state of Washington is one of the few states that allow undocumented people to get a license. Please don't change that law. So guess what, I come here to Seattle. I have a best friend, one of my best friends live in Seattle. I used her address, I got the license, I went to the downtown DMV here. They gave me the license, it was valid for six years. I looked at the license really, really hard. And then I said, I can't keep doing this, I'm done. I'm done. So I decided that I was gonna tell my own story and be in charge of my own narrative and do it in a big way. So I ended up coming out about my undocumented status in the New York Times two years ago, this June. Um, thank you. And we started Define American because this is not just about me and mine is only one story in this country. And then months came by and I'm thinking to myself, President Obama has deported more people than any other president. 400, four, around 400,000 400, people got deported that exact same year that I came out, yet no one was contacting me. I was on Colbert, I was on Diane Sawyer, but like... So I c called the editor of Time Magazine and I say, I wanna write a story about why I haven't gotten deported. <laughs> and he was like, are you kidding? I'm like, no, I'm not kidding. So I did, I wrote a story, and this time he was like, well, why don't we put your face on the cover of the magazine? I said, no, I didn't want that. <laughs> Instead, we had a cover of Time Magazine with 35 other undocumented people in it. Um, and the headline is, we are Americans, just not legally. 35 undocumented people from 15 different countries, right? And really doing this story for me was about trying to underscore all these questions that I would get asked. I've done about 120 events in 30 states in the past two years. And I've been kind of traveling the country like a walking uncomfortable conversation. <laughs> and I'm a journalist used to asking questions and now I'm the one getting asked questions. And the questions that I would get asked are in some ways the question that underscore the unequivocal fact that immigration is the most controversial yet least understood issue in America. People don't know, for example, that one million out of the 11 million people who are in this country without papers are Asian, a full one million. People don't know that 40% of the 11 million people are here who overstayed their visas. So they were actually here legally and they overstayed their visa. So not all of them crossed this border, right? So I would get to ask questions like, why don't you just make yourself legal? Because I'm a masochist and this is like so much more fun, you know, like <laughs> people would literally ask you that question. And you have to tell them that no matter how many times our politicians, including Mitt Romney, says people like me should get in the back of the line, they never seem to point out where the line is. That's one question. The second question, what about illegal don't you understand? And that's, and that's a tough one. We can make the legal argument 
that actually to be in this country without papers is actually a civil infraction, not a criminal one. So to call somebody illegal is actually legally inaccurate. We can make that, we can make that argument. But to me, the more important argument is simply no human being is illegal. No human being is illegal. Something gets very wrong when we refer to people like that. And for me, as I've been traveling around the country, including to, uh, we did a, a, civil, a civil, civil conservatory conversation. It was this really interesting event that my hometown threw a couple of months after I publicly came out. And we invited a lot of people. And this, re and this really gentleman, Conrad Sasno, who's a registered Republican, came to the event and he had my essay with me, <laughs> with him, and he had printed it out, right, and like underlined stuff, which was like, oh shoot, like he actually read it. And he put it up and he said, Mr. Vargas, do you think you belong in a special class of people who can break any law you want? So it, you say in this essay that you got a driver's license that you're not supposed to get. If I did that, I'd go to jail. Like here you are proudly doing this. You know, for me, that was a very important question. So I leaned back and I said, no, sir, I didn't get the license to spite you. I didn't get the license to say, oh, hey, look, America, what I can get away with. We get the license because, you know, I had to cover the Iowa caucuses and there's no buses in Iowa. We get a license because we got to go to school. We got to go to work. We got to get groceries. And Conrad Sasno leaned back and he was like, oh, I never thought about it like that before. Because as you all know, this conversation is way bigger than legal versus illegal. This conversation is not black or white. This conversation is all about the gray area that people and I live in every day. And this is a conversation that all of us have to have. I went to this really, you know, I love Eric Liu, and I got invited to this conference last year, and I met a man named Mark Meckler. Where's Mark? Mark, I'm sorry, I'm like embarrassing you, but Mark is like a cowboy. And uh, he's the uh, co-founder of the Tea Party Patriots, and uh, he gave me a cowboy hat, <laughs> which is pretty awesome. Um, but yesterday, <laughs> Mark and I had this great conversation about border security at a bar in our hotel, that I tell you, this is a conversation that we're not seeing on Fox News or MSNBC. It was an honest, real conversation about how two people who love this country can try to find a common ground to find a solution. And to me, this is what this whole conference, this is what Eric Lewis put together, this is what this is about, right? So now the question is, where do you fit in this conversation? All of you, where do you fit in this conversation? Is it enough that you contact your two Democratic senators and that you contact your 10 House members, six Democrats, four Republican, I studied? <laughs> or is it more that we need to make sure that we're talking to people who we think we may not even agree with without having, actually even having spoken to them? Look, my life is on the line. I wanna see my mom. I want my grandmother to find some peace. So this is really personal to me. And preaching to the choir is not enough. If I have to go to every Tea Party meeting or any anti-immigrant event or whatever I need to go, I'm gonna go. And we're gonna ask this question. And the last point I wanna make here is people say that to be this question of how you define American if you define it by pieces of paper, I have nothing to show you. I have no driver's license, I have no state ID, I have no US passport. All I have is a Filipino passport, that's what I'm gonna use this afternoon when I fly out of here to go home to New York. All I have is this cover of Time Magazine. All I have is a Wikipedia page that somebody created, I didn't know who created it, it's pretty accurate. <laughs> and all I have when I show up today at the airport is this cowboy hat. But I am an American. I am just waiting for my country to recognize it. And we need your help. We need your help. 
So thank you so much for having me here this afternoon. Thank you. As we come back here, I actually want to begin, um, we were just talking here on stage about ways in which each of uh, these three speakers has been uh, impacted by or feels like he or she intersects with the other two and the work that they do. And so uh, let me just actually start with the three of you and, and talk about these, the overlap uh, among work and care and claiming this country. Um, Jose, do you want to go first? Oh. Um, I actually think we're living in this really interesting age of intersectionality. You don't have to be gay to care about gay rights. You don't have to be a woman to be a feminist. You don't have to be in a labor union to care about workers' rights. You don't have to be undocumented to care about immigrant rights. And I think it's like this age of intersectionality and kind of this era of empathy. Um, I find it particularly interesting and um, also positive, in a positive way, to look at how young people kind of this millennial generation, you know, for, for like millennials, for example, gay marriage is a non-issue. They just think of it as a fairness issue. If you poll a lot of young people who have grown up with people like me in their classrooms and their neighborhoods, right, they think undocumented people should have a path to citizenship. So I think that's an interesting way of looking at it, and I find it that really interesting with what Adrian was talking about, like, you know, that we have the silver, what is silver generation? or Tsunami. Tsunami. <laughs> And I bet you, like, I, my grandmother is like my, you know, every day we talk on the phone and I just tell her, you gotta get, you gotta keep healthy. Cause you know, when I get a passport, we gotta go to like Africa and we gotta go to Europe, you know? And she's like the love of my life. And so I care about her a lot. And I know that I, you know, she was a food server for 21 years. I don't think she made more than $8 an hour her whole life. Um, yeah. So, yeah. This age of intersectionality, Ai-jen, what, what, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I was just thinking about that Ohio in 2020 slide and thinking about um, immigration reform. And the truth of the matter is, is that given who we're becoming as a nation and our, the, the aging of America, the demand for caregivers is going to increase by 48%. Meanwhile, the actual, by 2020, and meanwhile, the actual adult age working population who could provide care will only increase by 1%. So the question is, who is going to care for America, right? We're going to do it, right? We're going to care for each other. We're going to do that. But we actually need immigration reform. Right? We need to bring the millions of workers out of the shadows and onto a road to opportunity and to be able to help provide the work that is necessary to, to make this country run. And when I first started working with domestic workers, it was seen as a real shadow workforce and um, you know, really at the margins. And today when I look around, the conditions and the realities that define undocumented immigrant domestic workers increasingly define reality for every American worker, just like what David talked about. And without immigration reform, we're always gonna have shadow workforces and shadow economy. It's gonna be very difficult to build a vibrant, labor movement and a set of worker policies that actually work for every worker and strengthen our ability to, to, to support our families and live and work with dignity. So I think all of these things are so connected. Uh, Dave, before we go to you, I'm just going to make a general shout out to our sound crew. Somebody's got a live mic that's just bumping around and we're, and, and we're uh, hearing that. So um, let, let's thank you, Janae. <laughs> she confessed. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I agree with Jose and with Igen. These are all incredibly connected things. I mean, I'm, a, I'm the leader of a union of home care and nursing home workers uh, that is disproportionately an immigrant workforce all around the country, uh, here in Seattle and, uh, and elsewhere in Los Angeles and, and in New York. And so I, don't, I think it's hard to separate where one of these issues stops and another one starts. And, you know, our union's very... Uh, we are a partner organization to a lot of the work that iGen does, and we are on the front lines of fighting for immigration reform. But I guess what I would just say, uh, in, in, in sort of adding something and not just saying, yeah, I agree with everything, is that, you know, these are incredibly disruptive forces, 
right? And if you look at the disruption of human history involved from uh, moving from a hunter-gatherer society to an agrarian society attached to land and the creation of property rights, or the next great revolution of moving from a rural economy to an urban manufacturing and industrial economy where you made things and worked according to a clock, not according to the sun, and had something called wages and something called an employer. And now we're moving to the, to the third great revolution in the economy. It'll take place much faster and will be even more disruptive, right, with global shifts in uh, mobility of both capital and labor. And these are all of the issues that we uh, are addressing. And the question is, just as uh, the mobility of capital and labor and the information and service economy disrupts everything. What is the counter disruption that arcs towards justice for immigrant workers, for low wage workers, for all of us, as there were counter movements in the past that helped create justice from disruption? I love this idea of disruptions and counter disruptions. And, the, 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 uh, and, it, and when you overlay that on top of what Jose was describing of this intersectionality and this age of uh, if not empathy, this, this increased capacity to identify with others, right? Um, it, it just begs this uber, this meta question of who is us? The, the, all three of you are asking who is us and what does it mean to take care of us and for us to take care of us and make sure that there is an us that uh, is durable. And so um, we'd love now to hear from some of the table hosts about the conversation that uh, you were having at your tables and uh, some ideas. And because we're on this side of the stage and some of our lines of sight are oriented this way, I want to give a little love to uh, th this side of the room here. So Janae, um, uh, if you want to grab, grab someone. I need this, okay. And we're trending in Seattle on Twitter. <laughs> Oh, by the way, I meant to, to, to mention, for those of you who are tweeting, the hashtag for this uh, event is hashtag CU13. Eric, we're trending. I know, but that I, means you know, they know that. let's accelerate. <laughs> uh, my name is Riley Hager. I'm with the College Success Foundation. And I have a question for Jose. Yeah. For Jose, I actually, uh, my mentee, Ray Corona, he's an undocumented dreamer here in the state. Um, he says, what's up? We were texting about you earlier. But I have a question for you. I'm speaking in Yakima Valley on Tuesday with a, probably a room full of undocumented students in college. Yes. And I was wondering, what would you tell that group? I mean, we, we've talked a lot about what we're doing here, but if you could give them some words of hope, some wisdom, something that would give them inspiration right now to, to keep moving forward, what would you say to that group? Okay, hold that thought, because I want to get a few more uh, comments and report outs from uh, ta various uh, table hosts. Uh, Janae? Uh, my name is John Doherty. I'm uh, with Seattle Academy of Arts and Sciences. And uh, we were talking about the burdens on the youth uh, and how there are so many different causes that are very important. You know, homeless is a, homelessness is as important as equal rights, is as important as labor, is as important as uh, immigration. And in this new age of intersectionality, um, you know, everybody cares about everything. People from every different walk of life cares about um, every other issue. And so we were, we were talking about how do we get it so that we don't all have to worry about every single issue, that we can all take care of every issue without being anxious that you know we're all sort of split up and just not getting anything done. Great, it's a fantastic question. Um, over on this side, uh, Chris, yes. I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to take the mic, am I? <laughs> Hey, I'm Andrea John Smith, and um, I re was really responding to the whole cocktail of everything. But David, you really, uh, you really got me started. And then when you made the comment just a moment ago about the counter disruption and the disruption, the the thing that I was thinking a lot about when you made that comment was the idea of the uptick of of uh, things that are trending. So, for example, um, somebody mentioned um, gay gay rights. So, you know, there's something in the in the air, something trending around gay rights, and so. How, how can we as citizens track, you know, where it is that we can stick our energies and our time? You know, the idea of, you know, local action, civic engagement in groups, and then these large strategic organizations and conversations that are happening. You know, trying to figure out, like, you know, JD was just saying, it's like, how do we, how do we understand where it makes sense to, you know, stick, our, what's, the, what's the activity that makes the most sense and has the greatest leverage? 
Um, now, um, I'm going to invite uh, any of you to respond to any of these thoughts and questions and observations that uh, have just been brought out. Oh, um, lean in. To your, <laughs> lean in. It's a good <laughs> book. Check it out. Uh, Cheryl Sandberg's book. Um, to your question, sir, I get asked that a lot. I average like probably 30 of that on Facebook at least every day. Um, what do I tell dreamers, these young dreamers? Uh, I tell them for one thing that <laughs> we can't quit now. <laughs> um, the horizon, I mean, this is a, I think we're actually going to see immigration reform happen this year. And I, I do believe that. Um, but, but two things that I really keep in mind, and this is like, you know, my, my oracle that is James Baldwin, the author, the writer, who once said, I remember reading this when I was a junior in high school. A passage goes, the greatest difficulty is to say yes to life. The greatest difficulty is to say yes to life. When you're undocumented and all these doors close and everybody says no, it gets even more important to make sure that you don't say no to yourself. That you have to find a way to make it. And I, I want to just pivot that a little bit and make the argument that, you know how you hear a lot about how, you know, that America is in decline and the republic is seeing its last, I'm sounding like Gore Vidal, like all of that, right? Talk to an immigrant. <laughs> if you want to talk about how great this country is and how we need to re-energize this country. Talk to young dreamers, you know, who are fighting for something that people take for granted every day. Like one of my fantasies is to get like a conference of young dreamers next to like a student, American citizen students and have them talk to each other and just say, you understand that I had to get three jobs and try to figure out a way to get to college and you're just taking that thing for granted, dude. What's up? And the last point that I actually wanted to say in the speech that I didn't get to say is, I hope all of you, and this ties into what you're saying in terms of the, the burdening of this, like, I hope you don't take for granted what you have, is that you are citizens of this country, right? The fact that that is, that is actually, instead of looking at these things as problems, but look, looking at them as opportunities, that every day, whether you care about homeless people, labor rights, elder, all of that, that you can do something every day, right? To create the better future, not just for yourself, but for all of us. So I, I would not think, think of it as a burden and think of it more of a kind of as an opportunity. Um, and I think that's important. I, I, I am interested in um, both Igen and, and David, um, not thinking of it as a burden, but thinking of it as a challenge, right? I mean, the fact is that, um, Civic energy, like any kind of human energy, is finite and it is bounded, and um, and even when we act collectively, that is so, right? And so, um, one of the great things about seeing how these issues intersect is seeing how they intersect, um, but it also raises the question of how do we set priorities and how, within a movement that is oriented towards social justice, as David is saying, how does a movement collectively of citizens who want social justice say, now is the time to focus on this? Then will be the time to focus on that, and here's how we will move forward. Do you feel like it is possible to, to, uh, to do that? I, think the, I do think that focus is important and that people should connect to and do the work in the community that feels truest to them and to their story, but always look for opportunities to connect the dots and to expand how you define we and what is in your interest and what is in the interest of your particular issue or community or constituency. I think as long as we're, I think focus is really, really important because we do have limited time, but making sure that we continue to be in relationship to an ecosystem of citizens and citizenry and democracy, um, which I think is possible. And there will be times like now when there are certain um, movements or moments like immigration reform in this country. And it will be important for those dots to get connected for, and for there to be a, a wave of momentum that really crosses the, helps us cross the finish line. And those are the moments when we all have to rise up and step up. 
Great. D David, did you want to add anything? Before I think we... that this is all right. I think you've got to pick, you've got to follow your passion and find those issues, those organizations, those connections that you find the most compelling and, and can be the most passionate about and devote your energies I mean, What there. can people in this room do specifically to engage, for instance, on the rethinking and the reimagining of how labor is organized? If most people in this room are not, in fact, members of organized labor, what would, what would you invite people to I do? I mean, you, if, you are, if you live in Seattle, you can join an organization like Working Washington that's not a union. You don't have to be an employee or a member of anything to be able to uh, support workers in struggles that aren't always union struggles, but are sometimes just low-wage worker struggles. If you... Uh, are someone who is used to picking up that cloth bag to go to the grocery store or ca looking for the fair trade label to make sure that the environment wasn't damaged in the production of your cup of coffee, just have a conversation with someone you know about the person who handed you that cup of coffee, who's probably making 10 or $12 an hour, rides the bus to and from work, has six roommates, and may have been in that job for five or, six, or 10 years at this point in our economy. Like, make people aware of your concerns. And start with what you can do at your kitchen table with your friends, with the people you go to school with, and then join an organization, subscribe to an email list, tweet, and find the right hashtag to get connected to others who care. In the same way that I was saying earlier, we live in an age of networks. We live in an age where we understand ways in which we are interconnected and interdependent, and that is a great blessing in so many ways, but it is a, it is a challenge in that it forces us to think anew. We can't just put things in neat boxes anymore because we realize they don't fit in neat boxes. But we haven't quite figured out yet what the non-box version is of dealing with civic issues. And the only way we're going to do that is by doing that. The only way we're going to do that is by coming together and having the conversations you've been having that don't necessarily yield an answer uh, today, uh, but will prompt us to search more deeply and to try more deeply, and as David has said, experiment more, experiment more deeply with new ways of relating with one another and organizing one another. So please join me in thanking David Rolfe, Ai Jen Poo, and Jose Antonio Vargas. Thank you guys.